I am joined by the great Tracy Shukart. You probably know her on Twitter as Shy Girl. She is an expert energy strategist, and she writes about energy and materials for uh, Intelligence Quarterly. Tracy, great to have you back on Forward Guidance. Absolutely. Thank you for having me back. Always a pleasure. The pleasure is mine, Tracy. The last time you were here, the energy bull market was only getting started, and there were many months of explosive price action to the upside in oil, natural gas, and of course the stocks as well, not to mention the refined products. However, this past month has seen a pretty remarkable correction from with WTI oil, crude oil, going from something like $120 to now $96. For all the oil corrections that you've seen, would you say this is one of the more extreme ones? Well, I mean, I mean, if you look at like the 2008 or 2014, 16, then probably not. But, you know, what I think, you know, is happening in this market is initially we had that huge kick up um, when uh, the invasion of Ukraine came. Right. And so we had a lot of and then. And then another kick up when uh, it was announced that there might be sanctions on Russian oil, et cetera. And so a lot of that, we saw a lot of um, movement in not only energy, but also obviously uh, agriculture and metals markets and fertilizer markets, um, just because they're such a big exporter of natural resources. Um, and so I think, you know, now we're kind of seeing some of that when we, we realize now that, you know, we aren't seeing as much Russian oil taken off the market. Those buyers that have disappeared from the EU and from uh, Canada and the U.S. Um, have been taken up with, uh, you know, UAE, China and India mainly. So there's a lot less, you know, Russian barrels taken off the market. A lot of analysts thought there would be 4 million barrels per day taken off the market. And we're just not seeing that right now. And so a lot of that risk premiums being flushed out of markets at this point. So when you had that explosive price action uh, higher in, I think, the, the latter part of February, as the, as the invasion was just happening, Russia's invasion into Ukraine, uh, there, that was a lot of that was due to speculation that these barrels would come off the market. But as you say, and, and we've got some gr you've got some great charts that maybe we can we can put up showing how Russia is actually exporting more oil than it was in January before the war. So how would you given that, how would you estimate the fundamentals of the oil and natural gas market? You know, the, the oil market is still very tight, regardless, even before the invasion of Ukraine, before that risk premium, I mean, the physical market was still tight. We still have a supply deficit, um, you know, out to, you know, 2025 and beyond. Um, and that you can note that within the crude spreads that they're all in backwardation. So even as, and it's interesting to note that even as we had this big pullback recently, um, you know, the spreads have still remained very tight. So the physical market, is still very tight. And there's really, right now, there's a huge disconnect between those two markets. Um, and then if we look at the natural gas market, obviously, we're, we've been seeing that in JKM, which is the Asian market, and TTF, which is uh, the European market contracts. Um, you know, we have, even though US natural gas is, you know, a, substantially lower than the, both of those contracts, people have to remember that we also came from, we were trading at $2 forever, right? So um, being at, you know, five, six, seven dollars is pretty huge for the U.S. market. Definitely, but nowhere near as huge uh, as the European natural, oh, actually, you're talking about gasoline or natural gas? Nat natural gas. Natural gas. Right, right. So U.S. natural gas is expensive, but nowhere near as expensive as European natural gas. Yeah. Tr Tracy, how would you describe the current state of the European energy market? Why is natural gas so expensive if it's still flowing from Russia? And how vulnerable might it be if that supply is turned off? Yeah, well, I would sum up their energy policy as a disaster, <laughs> which I mean, to be quite frank, and I've talked about this, you know, I've been talking about this for a couple of years now. This is nothing new, right? Take away, again, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, they were having problems long before then. I, you know, for the year prior, we were seeing rolling blackouts. We were having problems. Smelters had to go offline. 
because energy was expensive. The problem is, is because they were trying to transition to um, renewable without really having a backup plan. So you can't really have intermittent power sources such as um, solar or wind as your base power load. You have to have either nuclear or natural gas or oil or something that's constant. And so- right. Or, or yeah. it can be uh, 150, you just have to have 150% of it, right? You have to be over, you have, have to have an overabundance of solar or wind. Right. It, well, exactly. And we just don't have, the thing is, you don't have, we don't have the battery storage capacity yet. I mean, the technology just isn't there yet. And so they were trying to transition too quickly to get to, um, you know, net zero goals, climate change goals, climate, climate accord uh, from Paris. Um, and so they were already having disastrous problems. And then add in, you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine, all of these sanctions that just exacerbated the problem. Now, this is why people are worried is because really um, the EU gets 67 percent of their natural gas from Russia. And they really, you know, it, they should have been looking at long term contracts with other countries long before, but they didn't. So now they're scrambling with, for long term contracts. They've, you know, settled some with the United States. They're also looking to Israel and Egypt right now. They're also looking to build out their own LNG you know, facilities, storage facilities, but those are going to take, you know, two to five years realistically to, to build out. Um, and, you know, it, when you're doing things last minute and say asking for the U.S. for more natural gas, you have to factor in, you know, travel times, right? It just doesn't come tomorrow. <laughs> um, so, the fear is right now, they are 60% full for winter, which is not not as terrible as, you know, it was looking a little bit earlier this year. That said, what is happening right now is that Nord Stream 1 is on its regular yearly plans maintenance of 10 days. And the fear is, is that Russia is going to decide not to turn those flows back on, particularly because they have asked for there was a, there's a part that they need that was from Siemens that was being fixed in oh. Canada. And so they were asking for that part back. Um, Russia asked for the part back. Ukraine said, please don't give the part back. So far, you know, it looks like Canada has agreed. The U.S. said we back Canada. You can lift sanctions. You can give this part back. Um, but right now, Russia is saying we don't have any of the paperwork saying that it's coming back yet. So it's kind of all a mess right now. And is that just an excuse? Like, you know, I'm lucky that you want to do my podcast, but if you didn't want to do my podcast, you would have an excuse. Maybe you'd have an excuse like, Oh, I can't find my headphones. I can't find my camera. You know, is that kind of like, Oh yeah, the part, or do they actually, is it real what they're saying? They need the part. I, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that I don't think it's an excuse. Okay. Here's, you know, here's what my thought is. My thought is, is that I don't think they're going to turn off, Nat gas now, right? Like I don't think, and and that part will be easily traceable. It's not like there's not going to be a way bill for it, and it's not going to be completely traced, and the whole world is going to be watching if this part actually moves to, um, you know, back to Gazprom. So you know that that I'm not worried about because um, that's easily trackable. But I don't think I know everybody thinks they're not going to turn it turn it back on after these 10 days. But I think if they really want to keep this more as a weapon, they would do that closer to winter, right? Closer to when they, if they intend to use that as a weapon, right? And perhaps they don't. I mean, you have to think about also, you know, they need the money too, right? They have sanctions. There's a ton of sanctions. Um, and, you know, that's 60, you know, that's a, that's a lot of natural gas that's Priced really high right now. And that's a you know great income. They're getting paid in rubles, so they really, in my opinion, at this juncture, don't really have an incentive to turn it off, unless you know things start to escalate again as far as sanctions are concerned. And I could be totally wrong. This is just my initial thoughts on this. Yeah, you do have a great chart of the percentage contraction in German GDP per standard deviation in gas flows. And you show that in, in January, 2023, 
or excuse me, the first quarter of 2023, so the winter, Germany could have, you know, a worst case scenario would be something like a 9% contraction in GDP, which would obviously be not just a recession, but a extraordinarily deep one. Yeah, it would. And you'd have, you have to start looking at, you know, we're already seeing manufacturing getting very, very worried um, in Germany right now. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people uh, that are trying to switch from gas to oil um, as their power source. Um, we're seeing, you know, BASF, which is huge, you know, petrochemical company, basically saying if we have to, you know, turn production off, you know, intermittently, that's what we'll have to do. If Russian uh, or if Germany's gas supply gets below 50 percent, they're willing to uh, basically take, you know, however, a week hiatus, two weeks hiatus. And we're already seeing that with like zinc smelters and things like that again for for the last year. And Germany has also said that we're going to, you know, try to make sure that this doesn't hit the consumer. And so, you know, we're, we're looking for the industrial, the manufacturing sector to basically take the hit if they have to. So, I mean, it, it'll, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens this winter. But. And to what degree do you think that the economic slowdown that we're seeing all around the world will destroy demand? You know, Tracy, I'm sure there are a lot of people who say, Tracy, you know, you're right about the supply. Supply is constrained for oil and natural gas, and that's been driving the price up. <laughs> but demand is being destroyed. And the huge crash in oil and natural gas prices is reflecting that demand destruction. And that's only the beginning of the fall in commodity prices. What would you say to that person? First of all, we're not really seeing demand destruction in the United States, which is absolutely the largest consumer in the entire world. Um, we are seeing demand destruction a bit in China because they're still on constant intermittent lockdowns. Um, and um, But what's happening is that why we're not seeing so much demand destruction is we have a lot of emerging markets that are, you know, providing a lot of stimulus and a lot of price caps and things of that nature. So that's not really helping the situation if, if what you're looking for is huge price demand. Um, because that kind of ensures that demand keeps going if you have, you know, if you're, if you're instilling price caps or, you know, some kind of incentive such as, you know, there's some countries that are giving you a monthly stipend. Um, you know, we even have some states in the United States that, that have been doing that. Connecticut, California have proposed ideas such as that. Um, so governments are really helping keep demand up if that's what you're what you're really looking for. And the thing is, is what I look at is that because it's a structural supply deficit across all of these commodities, again, it's not just the energy industry, it's metals, mining, um, agriculture. What I think is going to happen, what we see is the, the best example that I can kind of relate to right now is that is, is kind of in the 1970s, right? Where um, you had a lot of inflation, Volcker pretty much hiked us into a recession, but the basic fundamentals of the overall markets were an overriding factor. There was a su supply problem, right? And that reared its ugly head. And when inflation came back, it came back even stronger. And so I think that's going to be, you know, I think that's the easy or that's the closest example that I can um, equate this particular market with right now. And when you say there's a supply deficit or the, the markets are tight, uh, can you give us a, a little bit of a, exactly what you're talking about? And I'm going to put up some charts just to illustrate it, you know, to talk about sort of the stocks and, and the, the inventories and what you're seeing there. And I'll, I'll put some charts up. When you're talking about a structural supply deficit, that just means that demand is set to outstrip supply, which is already happening right now, um, right? We're, we're seeing, well, there you go. You can see, you know, global inventories are drawing much faster than we thought. That means demand came back much faster than we thought. And that we, what we're not seeing is that is CapEx to rebuild those across any of these. I mean, everybody hates metals, everybody hates mining, everybody hates 
you know, nobody wants to invest in this capital, you know, cap, we have a $750 billion CapEx problem deficit in the oil industry just to keep things level right now. So when I say structural supply deficit, I mean, this is going to, supply is going to continue to decline as demand is going to increase. And even if demand just marginally increases, the supply side still cannot catch up to that. I hope that makes sense. Right. And here, for example, we've got crude oil stock, stocks of crude oil, meaning. Right. So we're at the lower edge of the five year range and crude oil stocks. But we have to think that this this particular chart does not include the SPR, which we are draining quickly. So we also have, you know, an SPR draw problem. And, you know, the thing is that I think that's, you know, the SPR draw is helping kind of keep things steady right now. But that's set to run out. I mean, and there's only so much in it. I mean, by the time that we're finished with this allocated SBR draw, we're only going to have 25% left um, in the SPR, which is very frightening because if we ever have an actual emergency, we don't have a buffer now. Wait, so, so Tracy, by when? Because I, I know that this is the fastest draw of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve ever. But we still have a lot of barrels, right? So, so by when would we have be a quarter out? In like, so I mean, the, as far as the SPR draw, I think we're at it. we've drawn down to like four hundred million. But by the time this whole ever, you know, cause there were three SPR draw releases, right? And so by the time these are all finished, and a lot of them don't need to be repaid. Some of them need to be repaid, but not till later. And some of them. The last 45 million doesn't even need to be repaid. Um, so by the time from the height of the SBR to the end of, you know, as soon as we draw all of this, we will be at 25% of what we were at the height. So Tracy, why has the price of oil, if it's if the fundamentals are so bullish, why has the price of oil gone from 120 to 96? Well, again, Russian risk premium taken out of the market, which is Totally understandable. Um, but also we have to look at open interest. Open interest is on a huge decline right now. There's li the liquidity is very low. It's very easily pushed around. There aren't, um, you know, there's just not a lot of interest in the market. That said, and that's why I always stress, go look at the spreads, right? Go look at the calendar spreads. And then if you're looking at, you know, refiners, then you want to look at the three, two, one crack spreads. So what we've seen is even though we've seen this huge pullback in the price of oil in that front month price, the spreads have barely moved. So that tells us that the market is still extremely tight. The physical market. Yes. So the physical barrel of oil, that's right now. And then there's oil in a month. There's oil in a two months, oil in three months. That's all of a right. financial contract. And when oil that's closer to the present is more expensive than oil in the future, that's called backwardation. And it's seen as a bullish sign because everyone wants the oil right now. Whereas when f future oil is more expensive than current oil, that's contango. And that is uh, seen as a bearish sign or just definitely definitely not bullish. It's, it's a sign of not a tight market. Most corrections see a market go from backwardation to contango or from contango to bigger contango. But this time, the, the spreads have remained tight, which is quite interesting. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's exactly that. That's exactly it. And all I was going to add is, see, if you're an investor, right, you're a fund manager or something like that, and you're looking at the oil market, if you want to look to invest, um, you know, you like backward dated markets because you will buy in the back end in hopes that, you know, your, you know, th that oil moves up in the future and thus your investment gains value. Obviously, in Contango, nobody wants to be in that market because that means if you buy on the back end, you're gonna, your investment is going to lose value over um, over time. So that's why backward dated markets tend to be very bullish also for an investor fund standpoint. Again, the thing is, is that we're seeing this front month, these front months are just, there's no... Oh, there's no OI, which is open interest, meaning there's not a lot of people involved in these markets. It's not overly bearish. It's not overly bullish. It hasn't been at all. We do see some buying on the back end 
Um, but still, there's just not a lot of interest there, regardless of the tightness of the physical markets. And that probably could be because, you know, because in the United States and Canada and EU, we see governments continuously bashing, bashing on fossil fuels, right? And so that kind of makes it difficult, you know, the green energy transition, whatever. So that kind of dissuades people from wanting to invest, as well as, you know, we have a, seen a lot of banks over the last couple of years um, decide not to invest in oil and gas because ESG is the thing. Um, we are seeing that change a little bit where we're seeing interest in ESG um, go down over this this past year, over the past, you know, seven months, six months, seven months or so. And I think, you know, people are kind of realizing that, um, you know, ESG is just, just not 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 there yet. Right. We still we still need fossil fuels. We still need fossil fuels to, you know, if you want to make solar panels or wind turbines, that requires a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of metals, a lot of mining, which requires another a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of plastics, which require a lot of petrochemicals. And so there's really no way to get around fossil fuels at this juncture. And so this chart that we're looking at now, that is the December future of oil minus uh, WTI crude oil minus the September uh, spread. So you can see that September is way higher than December and it's, it's, it's quite historic. Yeah, exactly. So you can see those spreads are, you know, very backwardated at this point. <laughs> and then there's also the crack spreads. Remind us, what, what are those again? So three, two, one crack spread, it means it's what you can get out of a barrel of gasoline, what you can crack a barrel of gasoline, right? Or a barrel of oil, pardon me, um, into like heating oil. I mean, there's several crack spreads, but the most common one that people trade is heating oil, gasoline. What you you know what you can crack out of a barrel to make heating oil or gasoline. It's like a distillate. It's like a distillate gasoline kind of trade. Um, and so when those spreads are very high, that means that refiners are making a lot of money because those margins are very high. So. Um, you know, the higher they go, the more money they're making. That's great news for refiners. Right. And there's been a lot of altercations, verbal altercations between the White House in, in the U.S. and oil CEOs with President Joe Biden and, and his uh, spokespeople alleging that it's corporate greed, that the refining margins are so high, they're making too much money. Uh, you have a different view than, than President Biden. What, what is your view? Why, why, why are they making so much money? I, you know, for one thing, where were they in 2020 bailing out the oil industry when we had negative oil prices? I mean, we bailed out the airlines, right? Why not bail and the out the lines. oil yep. industry? They, they were in debt up to their eyeballs. And nobody seemed to care then that they were completely flailing. Yeah, a lot right? of bankruptcies so, in 2020. You know, that's kind of my feeling. And yes, they're making a lot of money now, but, you know, they've been through, you know, they haven't made a lot of money in a long in a very long time um so kind of demonizing these industries particularly when you're begging for more oil is kind of counterproductive at this point nobody's price gouging the market decides how much a barrel of oil is oil companies don't decide they don't just wake up one morning and say we're going to charge this amount the market decides right and this is what it's what the market is capitalism. It's what the market is willing to pay for for a barrel of oil, um, and you know if we look at gas stations, which is the worst. Gas stations literally make two to five cents per gallon on gasoline. They don't. They make all of their money on the convenience store, literally. And so they're definitely not price gouging. Their margins are so thin; it's ridiculous. Okay, so you've got a great chart showing you know, over a dollar of a gallon of gas is due to taxes, the U.S. government, and only seven cents is for the gas station. So we'll, we'll put that chart up. But Tracy, correct me if I'm wrong. Please, please do correct me if I'm wrong. But the profit margin for the gas station is different than the profit margin for the refiner, right? Like I think ExxonMobil sold, when you go to yes. a, a mobile sta gas station, that is not owned by ExxonMobil because it's not profitable enough, right? 
it's so so what is the profit margin if if you know gallon of gas costs uh, uh what it costs, like how how much money is made by the refiners how much i think that i have a chart up but it's still it's very you know it's i mean it depends on what the margins are um at, at that particular day is how much that they make on that particular thing but they're not you know they're not they're not out there trying to price gouge you and i did want to say one thing because i saw a lot of people on this on twitter saying um what do you mean big oil owns all the gas stations exxon you know there's so many exxon mobile stations most of these are still um franchised and owned by individuals they're not actually owned by big oil as far as these gas stations are concerned so right uh tracy you've got a really interesting chart of commodities during recessions and it looks almost uh it looks it looks very very reassuring if i were if for someone who's long commodities so this is commodities very and this is kind of this is kind of exa- this is kind of exactly what the 1970s did you see commodity prices high we have a recession sell off and then they rally again right and in particular during um during these times oil has or oil equities have performed very well, at least in the past. But um, this is exactly, you know, this is exactly what I, if you took a chart from the 1970s, which I think I have somewhere in there, but um, it kind of shows this exact pattern. Okay. So what's your view on oil equities? They've, they've suffered a lot as well uh, over, the, over the past month. Are you still bullish on them? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, I think if you're a longer term investor, some of these big pullbacks are very interesting because I think that, you know, they're still going to do extremely well. If you're a shorter term trader, I would urge caution in the market because it's so volatile right now. Yes, I I think that's wise. Tracy, a lot of oil companies we're making, you know, hand over fist money at oil at $120. They're still making good money with oil at $96. But if oil were to go to $66, perhaps they'd start losing money. Uh, although their hedges were, might start to work. How, what's, what is, at what price of oil would you think, like, what, what's your floor of oil with like, let's say 95% confidence? Obviously, look, oil in a month, it could go negative again for all we know. But what is, you know, that's a very rare outcome. What What is a certain level of, Man, if oil went below this level, I would be shocked. Is it what, fifty dollars, sixty dollars? Because some people are calling for thirty dollars oil again. I know they are. I would say at this point, I know they are. Everybody is, it, unless we saw like a global, like it, unless you know, we hiked us into a global recession or something catastrophic like COVID comes around again that just kills supply, kills demand right off. I mean, I would be shocked if we see oil below 80 right now. Yes. To be honest. Like I said, I want to caveat that because anything can happen in this world, right? I mean, um, you know, we could have CBs hike us into a depression. Obviously, that would change the demand situation. So outside of, you know, a huge black swan event, or a global depression, I would be surprised to see below 80 for any, you know, maybe a spike below, but I mean, I would be right. surprised to see it hold there. Yeah. If you're right on the supply side, it still would be possible for that to go lower, but it would sort of be like in 2008 and 2009 where it crashed, but pretty soon was back into, into a bull market. Tracy, so uh, what's your outlook on the much more economically sensitive commodities such as copper tin, iron, uh, you know, I, people, people buy copper when they, when they need to build a house. And, you know, I just looked at JP Morgan, they released their investor, uh, quarter report and their mortgage fees are down, are down something like 71% year over year. So, um, that's, uh, maybe 71% less copper. Who knows? Uh, what, what's your outlook on those sort of materials? Well, yeah, I mean, the housing market is definitely something to watch right now, but particularly in the United States and Canada and Australia right now, because they have, you know, particularly Canada and Australia have huge 
housing bubbles. And so as we hike, that's going to make things more and more difficult. So out, but you know, that's only a certain part of demand. If we are going to see these green energy goals come to fruition, like the West wants, you know what, like the EU and the United States and Canada have said that they wanted to do, we're going to need 10 times the amount of uh, basin industrial metals right now to get there. In fact, um, Global S&P just had a report out today, actually, that basically said that if we want to reach our goals by 2035, we're going to have to increase that. We're going to have to increase copper production by 50 million tons, I think, which is more than we've produced from 1900 to 19, or 2021. <laughs> so, you know, aside from, you know, the housing markets and things like that, which I definitely think you should be cognizant of, uh, and I definitely think, you know, that and China is uh, the reason why these markets are very soft right now. But looking forward, if we want to reach these green goals, we need a lot more of all of these metals. So again, if you're a long-term investor, you know, uh, we're looking at supply deficits across nickel, lithium, copper, um, I mean, you name it, as far as any of these basic industrial metals that are, you know, even even steel. Right. And, and that long-term narrative is still very bullish about electrification and so on. What about in the shorter term? What are you seeing in the stocks, the supply, the inventories of copper, iron, stuff like that? Is the fact that the price, are our companies, uh, is the supply much more elastic where because the price has gone up, folks are mining, mining copper, you know, oil that may be constrained, but what's the supply of copper look like? I mean, I, I mean, the supplies, we're still seeing lower supplies in these markets. Um, that said, really, again, I think that China is a main driver here because they've had all these lockdowns and because they're such a massive buyer of commodities, because they produce more solar panels in the world than anybody else. They produce more wind turbines in the world than anybody else. And so they're such a massive consumer of this because we've seen their demand slack. You know, that's kind of got those markets spooked. But in the long term, um, you know, they're still very, very bullish. We'll have to kind of see what happens in China as far as demand is concerned. We've got the People's Party Congress in October. I personally don't think it looks good for Xi to have his country on lockdown going into quote unquote elections um, for his third, third term. And so, you know, I think in the fall, we may see, you know, this pick up and we're already seeing, um, you know, we're already seeing a lot of stimulus plans um, that have been recently announced. Um, we're seeing a tiny bit of China credit impulse tick up a little bit if you squint. <laughs> um, so I would be um, so I'd be watching that. But those markets probably closer to the fall. Mm. So, so Tracy, you're a commodity bull. Uh, it, it's important that that folks know that, and when we we like you sharing your your perspective and your, and your knowledge <laughs> with us. What is the commodity? So you're bullish on a lot of commodities: natural gas, oil. What was what's the commodity you are least bullish on? What is the commodity I'm least bullish on? Um, I that's a that's a that's a hard one. I mean, I think it would depend on if. Well, I think precious metals don't look so great here. Don't kill me, everybody. I think everybody should have some gold and silver and platinum. But you know, right now, precious metals we're just not seeing that much demand right now. And so it's not that I'm not bullish longer, longer term. It's just probably um, kind of in my side basket over there. Mm. If that makes kind of sense. And does the slowing of economic growth worry you? The fact that, yes, we're still growing, but that pace of growth is itself slowing, you know, as measured by, let's say, the manufacturing uh, purchasing managers index, th that's just going down, 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 down every month. Is that, you know, if you're a commodity bull, typically you want, you want to see it go in the other direction, right? Uh, well, obviously, and that's why I'm saying in the shorter term, I would be very careful in these markets. Over the longer term, it's, a, you know, it's very bullish and everything's cyclical. And, you know, I think there's a lot of recession fears going on right now. Everybody's scared of the energy crisis. Is Europe going to completely shut down? 
right? Manufacturing wise or, you know, and uh, mining and smelting wise. Um, when comes this, this winter, um, and so I think there's a lot of fears going around now, you know, everybody, you know, we've got a lot of rate hikes, uh, priced in the markets right now. Um, people are kind of scared. We've got the dollar at, you know, we just hit 110 today, which is huge pressure on emerging markets right now. Um, so a lot of that is putting, you know, drag on on the commodities markets, at least in the, in this near term. And it's definitely something that you that you should watch right now, because um, particularly the dollar, because the dollar is literally destroying emerging markets right now. If you look at emerging market bonds, emerging market um, stocks, ETFs, I mean, and they, they look bad, really bad. What <laughs> what currencies, emerging market currencies, are sort of at the eye of the storm? Because to me, the, so the DXY is the euro and it's the yen and a spattering of other currencies. Those are both developed markets. So typically a dollar crisis happens when the dollar shoots up relative to emerging markets. But to me, it seems like the most you know uh, uh, beaten up currencies are the euro and the yen. What, what emerging market currencies are you looking at that yeah. are just... They are. In particular, I'm looking at if I'm, I'm looking at a Africa because really there's a lot of it's like commodities based continents. Um, and so, you know, if we look at like Kenya, Ghana, um, Nigeria, those currencies are literally crashing right now. Um, and that makes it all the more difficult to pay their USD denominated debts. Why is a, a rising dollar so bad for commodities. I get that commodities are priced in dollars. So when the dollar goes up, commodities go down. But is it just that? Is there something, is it just that? Or is there something more complicated? It's not, not really a one-on-one, -on -one, but right. Because we saw the dollar rise and oil rise all year. I mean, dollars at 110 and oil is still at 96 today. So that's not like, even though we've had a huge pullback, I mean, still $96 oil, which is huge with a dollar at 110. Um, <clears throat> So it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation, particularly in the, the energy markets. We've kind of see that co correlation go in and out, but really it has to do with uh, emerging markets uh, and commodities producers, right? If we're looking at um, commodity, especially uh, the major commodity producing companies, that that's really where the dollar really starts to hurt, um, say things like production and, and whatnot. And if I had to ask you, what are you more bullish on natural gas or oil? What would you say? Or some other distillate? I, or some other, I, I really, I do, I really like U.S. nat gas right now. Not actually U.S. nat gas as in the, the price wise, um, but as far as the equities are concerned, because U.S. out of, after we finish building out our infrastructure this year, we'll be the number one exporter in the world. And right. so I really like if you're looking at U.S. equities, plus we've just signed long term contracts with Europe um, and um, several other countries um, with Japan, for instance. And so I think if you're looking at equities in particular, you know, I like producers that also have distribution capabilities. Um, so it, for, for a longer term investment, you know, in natural gas realm, I, I really like that because right now, even though oil is very demonized, you know, there's kind of been a little bit of a switch on natural gas, right? We just saw in Europe, they just decided to call nuclear and natural gas green. Um, and so we're kind of seeing a little bit more of a shift towards um, being more natural gas friendly. And so right. I kind of I, I like that. Right. So America, you know, natural gas in America is here X and natural gas in Europe is 6X. So you like companies that can export natural gas from the U.S. to Europe. Seems like a pretty good uh, business model. Buy for a dollar, sell for six dollars. Uh, so, so by, uh, you know, uh, you know, people who listen to this podcast a lot will will uh, be annoyed. I'm saying this again, but it just goes to show how dire the energy crisis is in Europe. That the Green Party of, of Germany, that severely <laughs> opposed nuclear energy years ago, is is now embracing coal. What is your outlook on coal? Obviously, it's you know one of the most pollutant fossil fuels that that we produce, other than I guess what peat. 
but um, you know, ger- people, Germany is using coal once again. Uh, Everybody's using coal now. We should, I mean, this again goes back to the ridiculous energy policy that we have right now. I mean, Germany's shutting down their last three nuclear plants right at the end of the year and buying coal instead. And importing um, so electricity like- from France, which gets it all from, or gets a lot of it from nuclear anyway. Yeah. For, which, exactly. It's like a walking contradiction, Germany is. But um, yeah, I mean, I like, I actually like coal in the near term. With coal, you have to be careful because there's a lot of disconnects in the market depending on kind of the grade of coal that it is. And so when you're looking at coal as an investment or looking at a particular company, you kind of want to know. Um, which kind of coal are they they producing? Is it the kind of stuff that doesn't burn so well and heavier and kind of, you know, or is it very, the, the cleaner, cleaner coal? So um, definitely, I you know, I am actually bullish coal in the short term. I mean, over the long term, I think that it'll obviously be phased out a lot more. Um, but um, But I would urge caution in, if you're looking at particular companies, look at exactly what kind of coal they are producing. And then, so when you talk about coal, I think of Peabody Energy's hedging problems. And a lot of these, it's not just, you know, they're natural gas companies as well, where people tell me, oh my God, Jack, you got to look at this stock. They're just so much free cash flow. They're trading at two times free cash flow. And then I look at their net income statement and they've got $3 billion in mark to market derivative losses because they've hedged it out. Now, obviously they produce more than that, so they should be good. But how do you think about hedging at this stage? Obviously, if we could go back in time, we would buy stock. You'd buy stocks that are, haven't didn't hedge because of the explosive upside. But yeah, do you? So did, right now, you know, how do you think about hedging? And do you like companies that do hedge, hedge a lot, or don't hedge at all? I mean, I think you have to have some kind of hedges on it, particularly because we are seeing a pullback, and so that's great. But you know, you kind of want to look. Yeah, a lot of companies that were <clears throat> that had like 100% of their product hedged. Um, when markets shut up, obviously they're sitting on a bunch of losses, right? <clears throat> um, so I like to look at companies that are hedged, but 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 within reason, right? Because you never know how these markets can get very volatile. Um, so, but definitely I agree with you. you definitely look at kind of what kind of derivatives are they holding? What kind of hedges are they holding, particularly in the, the commodities markets? Because you kind of want to know, do we have, you know, if we have an adverse move and this, their entire supply is hedged <laughs> and it goes against them, that's bad news, right? Because they'll be sitting on a bunch of losses again. So um, I do think you should pay particular close attention to that. And, um, <clears throat> I personally like people that are hedged, but again, not, you know, not 100%, 200%. Yeah, Tracy, what are the area of equities within commodities that you think are kind of the most overrated? So, you know, in the commodity bull market from 2009 to 2013, 14, there were certainly a lot of stocks that produced a ton and they issued a ton of debt and it was kind of a bubble and it, it didn't really materialize. Are there any, is there any sector, whether it's iron miners or, or copper miners? Basically, what are the stocks of commodities that you don't own and why? What, that I don't like? Yeah, you um, don't own you or know, you I don't think, like, or you like less because I know uh, you're a commodity bull, yeah. I don't want to give names, but yeah. you know, I think you have to be, I think with mining stocks, you have to be uh, very careful, right? And so um, I would look at, you know, particularly at mining stocks, I actually like miners over, you know, like front month uh, futures prices. That said, you have to do a lot of research in those because, you know, there's a lot of mines that are not really producing anything. You, ha- you know, you kind of have to really look through, you have to really do your research and kind of comb through those miners um, to see really what are they producing? What, you know, what new finds do they have? You know, are they viable? Um, can they get to them? You know, and the same, same thing for the energy sector as well. What is the commodity that is seeing the most rapid pickup in supply? And perhaps we'll exclude agriculture because, you know, like people say about, oh my God, the price of lumber has gone, gone up. It's exploded higher. But I'm like, 
it literally grows on trees, you know? So it's the same way with, with, with wheat, you know, you just plant more wheat, corn, the cure for high prices is high prices. Maybe not a natural gas and oil because of everything that's going on, the supply issues, but what are commodities where it's like, oh yeah, the price of iron quintupled and the supply has quintupled in response. So the where price, wait, so what are you asking? So if price went up and then supply went up, yeah, up yeah, com with commodities it? that have been very responsive to the surge in prices, you know, clearly oil has not been responsive production has you right. know, budging up, but not exploded higher. But you know, is, is it the case of if in iron or copper where the miners are, they, they are picking up and they're getting in spare capacity or is there no commodity like that? So, I, I mean, I, I mean, I the lumber market, I would say, and you know, that's really indicative of, of the lumber market. Prices are going higher, then you have more, um, then people want to produce more. Been, we've been watching the lumber market in particular for the last six months because we've been anticipating a problem in the housing market. And that's, you know, uh, that's coming to fruition, you know, particularly in Canada right now, whereas, you know, they just had a hundred base point hike. And so I think I tweeted something out. You better be watching the housing market right now because you're going to have a lot of problems in the mortgage industry. Right. And how do you think that affects commodities? You know, the, 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 the impact between housing and, and oil might not be obvious, but there are instances when sort of the correlation goes to one. And yeah, if there's a problem in the financial system, the price of oil will go down. Uh, how do you sort of think about that? Like, are you thinking that the, the odds of a continued pullback are more likely just because of the short term nature, even though you're a longer term bull or or no? Um, you know, I think, again, with the housing market, it's, you know, it, it's very uh, geographic centric do you know what i mean like you know i'm sure you'll see problems with home builders and you'll see problems with um you know in the lumber market which we're already seeing but you know so i think it'll be depend on that particular area but i don't think it's like a i don't think it's a global phenomena right and so i wouldn't say yeah you know we may have lumber copper um builders problems in say you know australia Canada, some in the United States, that's not really enough to move the entire global market as far as, you know, these particular uh, commodities are. So I think it's more, you know, local centric and obviously will depend on how big of a blow up it is. <laughs> Do you think that commodity prices will continue to push inflation rates higher? I think eventually, I think we're seeing a pullback and we'll see a pullback now, right? Um, and I think we probably haven't seen the end of this pullback at this particular time. But overall, um, you know, the Fed's going to have to ease up at some point, right? And they're, they're not going to just hike forever. Um, and again, it's kind of in line with the 70s where, you know, we hiked us into a recession. We're in a recession. They had to stop hiking. We had fundamentals in the um, oil markets in particular take a hold. We saw inflation shoot much higher than before. I think we're on track to sort of have that same scenario, even though the circumstances are slightly different. Um, you know, we have to see how these recessionary fears play out. We have to see kind of what central banks continue to do over the next, you know, six, nine months in particular. Um, and then I definitely can see prices going much higher than they than the current recent highs. Tracy, I remember we did an interview, I think, in January of this year, and I asked you if you were thinking about investing in some of the solar or wind uh, stocks. And I believe you said no, because I think they were overvalued. What do you say now that the yes. price of oil and, and gasoline is, is so high that the uh, it makes it more inclined. You know, if I, if I, if I was on the fence about getting a solar roof in January, I'm, I might get it now. Uh, moreover, the price of the solar stocks have like been cut in half. Yeah. I mean, I think that I'm still not a huge fan of those stocks as far as the equities are concerned, because we are seeing, um, we are seeing an uptick in, um, in prices for those just because we still have supply chain issues, right? We still have problems in China with shipping. We still have tariffs, some of those tariffs could be moved, but we're still seeing costs of those uh, particular um, renewables 
still etch higher, which means that companies are not making as much money on them. So still not a huge fan, still not a huge fan yet. I'll let you know though. I Please swear. do, Tracy. You got to keep coming every, every few months. Uh, I know you're not a fan. <laughs> That's why I like to ask. <laughs> Tracy, isn't it true though that oil stocks, copper miners, gold and silver miners, they too are struggling with inflation uh, costs. You know, a lot of the, the pipes, the OC, what are they called? OCTGs for, for natural gas and oil, those have exploded higher. A lot of people who buy a silver mine because they think it's an inflation hedge, guess what? The costs of a silver mine just went up 30% over, year over year. So what about the input costs? What do you think about the input costs uh, in these commodities? Does that make you less bullish? Because the profit margins well, are down? Well, exactly. Uh, well, not over the long term. Well, again, it's it's cycle. First of all, energy is everything, right? Energy is your major input cost for all of these commodities. You need energy to mine. You need energy to grow food. You need energy to grow livestock. You need, you know, that's your major input cost if you're a producer of any of these commodities. And so, um, what what will help you? What will help the market? You know, aside, you know, what we have to watch, what the Fed's going to do, how, how recessionary, what demand's coming off. But the thing is, is that, as you know. These pullback in prices are going to jump start, you know, uh, another, you know, jump up in commodities because, you know, if you start seeing a pullback in energy prices, you're able to produce a little more or whatever, um, which makes um, those companies look more attractive again. Again, you know, in the short term, I urge caution in these markets, especially if you're a trader, if you're not, you know, a long-term investor, um, because this pullback probably is not done yet. That said, if you're a longer-term investor, using these pullbacks to, you know, initiate some positions in the market, I think is, you know, it's a good opportunity. Yes, I, I think that's. I'm really happy you said that, Tracy, because, uh, you know, it's it's it's. It's true. If you're, if you're a long-term bull, like price opportunity, price declines are opportunities to build a position. But you know, when when someone who's as bullish as you is saying, "I don't think this decline is over," like that says something to me, and maybe it should say something um, to to our audience. Tracy, you got a chart of the price of electricity in France and Bitcoin, Tesla, GameStop. Have, they've got nothing on this chart in terms of explosive <laughs> price potential. Just you know, I don't know if you're talking to people in France or you're, you're you're reading some reports about there. What is the economic impact when the price of energy goes from you know fifty dollars a, a fifty euros per megawatt hour to four hundred and fifty euros per megawatt hour? I mean, that, that's like, I mean that's huge, and we're seeing that in Germany too. And those are and that's why they're talking about you know we may have energy rationing this winter, right? France is talking about it. Germany is talking about it. Um, because those prices are so high, um, you know, and demand is somewhat inelastic, right? Businesses have to run. You, you know, you still need heat in the winter. You still take a hot shower, you know. So demand is somewhat inelastic um, as far as that concern. And so, and this is why, you know, this is what you know, that that market is telling us that because prices have exploded, you know, that market's telling us that that market's very tight. And we may have a huge problem at summer. Now it could, or this winter, but it, that those prices obviously could come down if we, you know, if flows, you know, remain the same or, or even more, and they're able to, you know, fill those gaps in electricity market, you know, we could see that those prices come down a little bit, but the forward market is telling you that this market is very tight. We don't have enough electricity. We've got a problem. <laughs> And how like, you know, a lot of people are calling for a recession in Europe as well as in the U.S. We did have a contract and a real inflation adjusted contraction in GDP in the first quarter uh, for the U.S. And then for the Atlanta Fed, it looks like we might have another one as well, which is sort of the, the layman's definition of a recession. Of course, the, it has to be the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research. They're the ones who sort of get the, the to pick and choose whether it is inflation or not. But what is your, you know, what do you think, how are you weighing the probabilities of a recession both in the US and Europe? Well, I mean, I think we're probably, I, I think, I think Europe's already in a technical recession for sure. 
Um, I think we probably already are either. I mean, you never know you're really in a recession till, you know, till you're almost out of a recession. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So I think we're probably in somewhat of a technical recession or at least headed there. And I think Europe is probably already there. Right. And, you know, I don't have a back test ready, but if if I had a choice about whether to invest in commodities during a recession or not during a recession, I'd imagine that you want to invest in them not during a recession. So what would you, you know, does the fact that you think we're in a you think we might already be in a recession? Is that what's sort of giving your bullishness some some caution? So, well, yeah, that exactly. You know, that's why I said kind of, you know, I don't know if this pullback's entirely done yet. I don't know where we're at. I kind of need, you know, want to look to the to the Fed and we need to have some more data come in because we're really just starting to get, um, you know, end of Q2 was really, we were starting to see some, some weakness in, in Q2. So that's not really a long enough time horizon at this point to um, really say whether we are or we're not or the exact direction that we're headed, in my opinion. Um, so that's why I urge caution in the commodities markets right now. Uh, Tracy, is there anything else you'd like to cover before before we reach a close? Uh, uranium, lithium, nickel? Uranium, everybody asks about uranium. I like uranium. The problem with uranium is it's such a difficult trade if you've traded it. I mean, I've you know, been in and out of that market for 20 years. It's such a difficult market. And most of the time, it's not, has not been really a money maker. Yeah, right? the stocks just suck. The market's, like, the market's like quick. Like you, you make your money, get out fast. But holding it is, I mean, it's just such a fickle market. It's really hard, even though it, sh it looks like it should be bullish. You know, we, you know, you just had Japan say they're going to restart nine new nuclear reactors. We had Germany say, yeah, OK, we'll consider nuclear green. So we are seeing a little bit of turnaround. We're seeing a lot of building um, in Africa and in uh, Pac Asia. Um, but still, that that market is hard to get off the floor. <laughs> and that's market's just been that way, unfortunately. I do like uranium. I'm just saying it's a very difficult mar market to trade. Mm. What about lithium? Um, I love, well, I, I love lithium. I mean, I think that we're going to need so much more lithium. Um, I, I do have a report available on, my, on our website on lithium, actually. Um, I mean, the, the, one of the largest lithium mines is in Australia called Greensfield. We're going to need 20 size 20 of those, if we really want to reach our, uh, you know, our 2035 and 2050 Paris Accord goals. So we need a lot more lithium too. We need, and we need, because we need batteries. If you want to store in, intermittent power, if you want to store solar and wind energy, these, we need to build out battery technology. And so we need better batteries and we need more lithium. And for EVs and whatnot as well, obviously. What about rare earths and specifically uh, neodymium, praseodymium? <laughs> I like. I obviously I like rare earths. If we're you know still, that, I mean they have a lot of uses aside from just solar panels. Um, so and know, I know you love solar I, I panels, think, Tracy. Your favorite, right? Solar is your favorite. I love solar panels, but uh, I, I mean rare earths are still used in a lot of you know other other things other than, you know, most, most people just talk about renewables. Um, so I definitely like that. What I would like to see really is um, I would like to see a shift to out of China and not have to rely so much on China, even though they have um, the largest reserves. Um, we still have, there's still a lot of reserves, untapped reserves elsewhere, uh, you know, in the United States and Australia. Um, and so I would like to see kind of um, I would like it better if we could start seeing those reserves tapped, and then I would, I, I would be really bullish on those particular companies. Great. Well, Tracy, it's been fantastic having you on Forward Guidance. People should definitely check you out uh, on Twitter at Shy Girl. And Tracy, you you write these reports about materials and energy uh, for Intelligence uh, Quarterly, which if folks have seen my interviews with Nick Glinsman, uh, he, he uh, started that. Where can people find your reports? So it's at intelligencequarterly.com. Um, we do we have uh, reporting from you know 
institutional investors to retail investors. Um, there's also a lot of free information on that site, a lot of free write-ups on that site. So, you know, I urge you to go go check it out. There's a, you know, good, good information there. And of course, that's where you can find my reports um, where, you know, you can subscribe uh, monthly or yearly. Yes, wonderful reports, great insights and fantastic charts. Tracy, thank you so much. Thank you. There is something that you need to be doing right now, and that is reading the BlockWorks daily newsletter. For top market insights and the latest in crypto news, you have to subscribe to the BlockWorks daily newsletter, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to this video or by visiting blockworks.co forward slash newsletter.